Okay, so let's. Right, so our goal is to design efficient codes. Yeah. Sure, sure. So right now, we at least in the first part, we, we studied bounds on the size of codes for adversarial channels. And then we also studied some constructions, explicit constructions of codes using algebraic tools. Uh, now we, we switch gears. We, our goal is to design efficient codes for large blocklets. So this is exactly what we, see, what we saw uh, in the information theory code. So we are given a noisy channel. Our goal is to design a good error correcting code, uh, which which can be practically implemented. Right? Uh, we're okay even if uh, let's say we can't prove too many things. Uh, even if we can't prove that it is capacity achieving using an efficient decoding algorithm, we may still be okay. But our goal is that the algorithm must be very efficient and we should be able to operate at rates somewhere close to capacity or, or even otherwise just try to understand what kind of algorithms can be implemented in practice and how do we characterize these how good are they right so so this requires completely different techniques uh, compared to what we've seen before so first we've seen some combinatorial techniques to study error correcting codes then we took a very algebraic approach and now we're going to go to the realm of what are called modern coding theory which which is largely based on graphs uh, and and some other tools which is a lot of intersection with with physics and uh, graphs and, and many other areas in computer science as we'll see as we go along right and in the last class, we saw a class of codes, convolutional codes, which can be at least very efficiently encoded, uh, maybe not so efficiently decoded. We've not seen a decoding algorithm yet, but, but these are basically linear codes where the block length is not necessarily fixed. Right? So in block codes, uh, encoding was basically a linear operation, which was written as matrix multiplication. We had a generator matrix. So there's a message vector which is multiplied with a generator matrix to give you the code word. But now you can sort of generalize this idea uh, instead of using fixed block lengths. Uh, you instead say that no, my code is going to be uh, an FI a filter. So in any if if I if you don't necessarily fix the length of the message sequence uh, and instead treat both the message sequence and the code word sequence as perhaps infinite maybe going from minus infinity to infinity. You can view these as signals uh, and, and one way and sort of the simplest sort of operations on filters are linear time invariant system, right, which can be written as filters, right, discrete time system. So, so therefore the encoding process is just some linear time invariant system uh, for which all you have to do is, is design a good filter. Uh, so, so now you can bring in tools from signal processing, uh, with, with, so very, which is a fairly mature field, and, and use that to design good codes, design and analyze code. And that was what brought about convolutional code. So for a, lot, for a long time, convolutional codes were what was used in practice. But unfortunately, as it turns out, if you want this, these convolutional codes to be very efficiently decodable. Uh, there, there are some constraints on the kind of convolutional codes you can use, and, and therefore they, they don't really get you close to capacity. So they, they perform better than, let's say, short block length codes. Uh, you can perhaps design convolutional codes. Uh, but, but in general, if, if computational complexity is not so much of an issue, it was observed that block codes always outperform convolutional codes. The main advantage of convolutional codes was that they could be encoded and decoded very efficiently. So we saw some definitions with respect to convolutional codes. Uh, basically, any 
So, so one way to think of a convolutional code is a linear time invariant system, and the simplest time invariant systems are FIR filters. So, you can define the convolutional code using the generator sequences, which are essentially just the taps corresponding to the FIR filter. So again, there are various canonical forms. There's a lot of theory behind convolutional codes. There are books, in fact, written which which deal only with convolutional codes. Uh, but but before going to before introducing the the decoding algorithm for convolutional codes, I thought it would be good to give a more general uh, sort of approach to designing decoding algorithms for convolutional codes and in general many other graph-based codes. Right. So our goal is to somehow get a, a unified approach to designing a very large class of decoding algorithm. So the main problem is that we know how to construct good codes, at least in principle, because if you pick a code at random, it, it you, we know that it, it gets you a very low probability of error, even if you are operating at rates close to capacity. The only problem is that we have to do maximum likelihood decoding or typical set decoding, both of which take exponential time. So really the goal is how do you design codes which can be decoded very efficiently. So, so right now what we are going to do is instead of focusing on the code itself, so remember even the first part when you talked about uh, Reed Muller codes and Reed Solomon codes, our focus was on the codes themselves. Right now, we are going to use a slightly different approach. Our focus is going to be on algorithms. Given any code, is there a way to decode it efficiently? Doesn't matter how well it performs, but given an arbitrary code which, which satisfies certain structural constraints, how do you come up with a good decoding algorithm? You know that encoding can be done fairly efficiently. If you use a linear code, then encoding is just matrix multiplication. Quadratic time, fine. Let's, let's say we are happy with that. But decoding is really the, the hard part. Coming up with a good decoding algorithm is not easy at all. So and and our goal is to understand. So we're going to use this, take this approach of trying to understand decoding algorithms. We'll start with let's say maximum likelihood decoding and see how we can maybe approximate maximum likelihood decoding or try to see in which cases can maximum likelihood decoding be done very efficiently. Right? So in doing so, we I, I introduced this, this, this sort of uh, notion of the distributive law. Uh, so the very simple example that we took was to find a, a sum of products, right? For example, AB plus AC. If we just look at AB plus AC, the number of arithmetic operations you require to compute AB plus AC is three. But if you use the distributive law, you can write AB plus AC as A times B plus C, which requires just two arithmetic operations. So there's a saving of one arithmetic. Now this may seem very minor, but in fact, when you have a huge number of terms, some of uh, you have some of products of multiple terms, and if all the terms don't necessarily involve all the variables, as long as sort of these product terms are kind of loosely coupled in some sense, you can get huge gains or huge savings in terms of the computational complexity. So even in this simple example, where you just wanted to find summation over all x, y, z, f of x, y times g of y, z, uh, the, the brute force approach requires you to, to do this in co using complexity um, order size of x times size of y times size of z. But on the other hand, if you use the distributive law, then you can write it in this particular form. So since observing that the first term involves x and y and the second term involves only y and z, you can use the distributive law and then co actually compute this using uh, just complexity, size of y times size of x plus size of z. If, if, if the size of each alphabet is very large, then this can correspond to much larger. And in practice, uh, as, as we'll see in a number of examples, you can in fact get huge savings, uh, particularly when there are a huge number of variables. So the kind of problems that we're looking at is where you have, the number of variables is very large and the number of terms is also very, very large. 
So instead of looking at specific examples, it, it, it helps to generalize this particular problem. Right? So earlier when we were talking about sums and products, we were looking at fields, fields or rings. In but now you can sort of generalize this because we don't really require multiplicative inverses. Our goal is to just compute sums of products efficiently. Right? So all that we require is, well, we need a well-defined notion of addition. We need well-defined notion of multiplication. We want this to be commutative and associative and, of course, distributive. In addition, we will, we will want uh, this, these to have identity elements. But even if there's no additive inverse or there's no multiplicative inverse, we don't really care. Right? Uh, and, and so we define this notion of uh, a commutative semi-ring, which is essentially like a field, but we don't, but, but which does not contain uh, additive or multiplicative inverse. And they need not contain additive or multiplicative inverse. Right? And we saw some examples of commutative semi-rings where this these two operations, there's one operation which is similar to addition, there's another operation which is similar to multiplication, but they need not be addition and multiplication at all. So, for example, we saw the min product semi where the first operation is the minimum of terms, the second operation is the product of terms. Similarly, so we saw the max product semi ring, where uh, the first operation is the maximum, so maximum is similar to addition in some sense because it is commutative. The maximum of two terms is commutative. Maximum is associative. There's an identity element depending on the set you choose. Uh, for example, for the max product semi ring, the identity turned out to be zero because max of zero comma any other number is is always equal to a particular. Number. And and pro and and the other most important thing is that. Uh, the distributivity holds. The distributive law must hold. So you had a times b plus c. So a times max of b comma c is a times is max of a b comma max of as long as a is positive or non-negative. And again, we saw the min sum semi ring. So all of these are semi rings. Uh, and, and these sets could be very, very different, not like fields at all. And, and indeed, some of, these, some of these sets that we saw, some of the semi-rings that we saw, don't necessarily have inverses. For example, if you take the max product semi-ring, the additive inverse does not exist for any element except 0. And the multiplicative element also does not exist. So, again, the additive Maybe it's wrong for me to call it additive inverse because there's no addition over here. The, the operation that we're considering is max. So there's no notion of an inverse. So max of a comma b is either a or b. But if I tell you just the maximum, now we are coming back. So, right? Or okay. So now, our goal is to understand, again, I haven't told you why I'm defining it in so much generality, what is really the utility of, of doing this. You see that each, many of these semi-rings naturally arise in certain problems in computer science and in coding theory. So, but before that, I'll introduce this very general problem, which I'll call the marginalized a, a product function. So, so let's go back to that original example that we had, where we wanted to compute summation overall y z f of x y times g of y z. Our goal is to, our, in that particular case. So our goal was to compute this particular summation. 
but in general we may be inter interested in something different right for example these could be let's say probability mass functions or conditional probabilities and maybe you want to marginalize this with respect to x or marginalize with respect to y or marginalize with respect to z but you even that basically involves a sum of product term. so marginalization would correspond to summation over all y z f of x y times y z so basically whatever x many marginalize you want to compute x many terms of this particular right now for this to make sense to for, for this marginalize a product function i could also i could i need this need not just be summation over all uh, a y z f of x y g of y z if if f and g satisfy certain properties for example if f and g are both non negative then in fact i can not just design algorithms which sort of efficiently compute this but also maybe max over all x y z f of x y y comma z so have so this is call this problem number 1 given a, a general function f I mean, given general functions f and g one problem could be to compute summation over all x y z f of x y g of y z another problem could be to compute max over all x y z f of x y g of y z now in 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 either in both cases the brute force approach essentially has the same complexity right because you have to compute each of these particular terms and you have to take the maximum pairwise so assuming that the max of two terms takes unit time one operation the logical operation it's not a uh, an arithmetic operation but let's assume that all operations take the same roughly the same amount of time correct okay so this is one problem this is another problem In each of each of these two the overall complexity to to this is size of x times is of y times so you compute this particular product term for each x y z triple and then in this case you want to sum it up in this case you want to find the maximum of those values that's one that's problem number 2 this is problem number 1 problem number 2 similarly i could have let's say min overall possible x y z f of x comma y plus y comma z again once again i have to compute this function for all possible x y z and then to find the minimum so these three problems may seem very different i would say but but this is but now we have a general framework to handle these three types of problems in fact all these three are basically a sum of products except that these are not the regular sum and the regular product they are operating on different rings you can view all of these three problems as essentially the same problem or specific instances of a more general problem where you want to evaluate a sum of products but over different rings so this is is basically over the field the r but this is over the max product semi ring so this is over the sum product semi ring and this is over the min sum semi so if we design an algorithm let's say for this particular semi ring or if we design a general algorithm which works for any semi ring it will work for any other semi ring as well so that's the utility of abstraction and we'll see that there are different problems in each case you can 
you can bring it to a sum of product terms either in the sum product semiring or the max product semiring or the min sum semiring right so before that let's introduce some more notation So suppose we have again we are looking at uh, functions which in general have multiple variables. So let's assume that the function has n variables x1, x2, xn. We are looking at problems where the number of variables is fairly large. In general, each of these xi's could come from different alphabets xi comes from some i uh, and and we'll call each of these uh, different names so ai so x1 x2 up to xn the variables they're called local kernels Sorry, uh, these are these are called local variables. And these are basically the domains corresponding to each variable. And we're typically interested in functions which can be written as a sum of products. So there are multiple functions. Uh, Let's say alpha one, alpha two, up to let us say m. And each of these functions, which are called local functions, don't depend on too many of these local variables. So not each alpha i is a function of all the x i, all the x j. So each alpha i is maybe alpha 1 is a function of just x1 x2 alpha 2 is a function of x2 x3 so there are m local functions uh, and corresponding to each local function uh, we have a particular local domain each each i i can define a set i which is a subset of so each si basically tells you which of the i which of the n different variables participates in the ith local function this variables alpha i and and each alpha i so let's say that alpha 1 corresponding to alpha 1 let's say i have s1 which is maybe 1 comma 2 and maybe corresponding to alpha 2 I have s2 which is the 3 comma 4 so alpha 1 is a function of x1 and x2 alpha 2 is a function of x3 and x4 so, so alpha 1 is basically going to be a function from a1 2 it takes two variables x1 2 and the range is now going to be the same area so it's going to be the commutative set
we see a lot of examples i mean getting used to the notation takes some amount of time uh, but but let me just state all the various definitions so these are the local so alpha 1 alpha 2 and so on are local functions corresponding to each local function i have a subset of of variables which which participate in that particular local function i'll call them si i'll use the same notation throughout so alpha i is going to be the ith local function uh, si is going to be the set of variables which correspond to the ith local function and uh, k is going to be the commutative semiring in general it's it, most probably it's only going to be the sum product semiring which is basically the set of all reals with addition and multiplication or it's going to be the max product semiring, which is the set of all non-negative numbers uh, with with maximum and product, or the min sum semiring, where it, it could be the set of reals and and the operations are minimum and sum. Okay, so these are uh, I'll just to just because I want some. Um, simple notation because uh, because i don't know which of the si variables which of the elements are in si i'll define a si as basically a So for example, in this case, A S1, by A S1, I mean A1 times A2. One, remember that this is a set and this is also, this is, this is actually a product of set. So A S1 basically is A1, A2, A S2 is basically a3 this is just to keep notations succinct okay. similarly I'll, I'll use the same thing for x s1 as well x s1 would be x1 comma x2 the pair x s2 basically x3 comma x4 and so on because i have multiple variables i have functions of multiple variables corresponding to multiple domains uh, i'll i'll use subscripts being sets which which corresponds to a set of variables which 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 are participating in particular operation similarly i have x So basically, each alpha i is a function of x s i, or alpha i is a function of function from a s i to the commutative. So these alpha i's are called local functions or local kernels. So these are local functions. Our goal is to compute or, or perform some operations on the global function. So remember, originally, so in the first example that we had, we had f of x1, f of xy times g of yz. So you can think of f being one local function, g being another local function. But our end goal is to sort of compute the sum of products or so we are going to define a global function or a global kernel to 
which is just the product of all the local kernels. So now this is a function of all the xi's and it is basically r of 1 times alpha 2 of 2 m Again, I'm writing this as a product, but in general, this is going to be product in the semi-ring. So, for example, if I'm using the min sum semi-ring, this is basically going to be alpha 1 of xs1 plus alpha 2 of xs2 and so on. Our goal is basically going to be marginalization of this with respect to some variable or some subset of variables. So, you fix a particular S, the subset of N. In fact, we are going to take the S to be one of the SIs. Okay. So our goal is to basically find beta of x s i which is summation over all possible variables except those which there. so i'll write this as x n minus or you know, if i want to be even more it even more simple x SI complement beta of X. Okay. In some cases, I may just be interested in summing with respect to all possible. In which case, SI this one SI, which is just the empty set. If I take SI to be the empty set, then basically I'm summing over all possible exiles. I have this very general problem. If I want to do it brute force, then it is then the total uh, complexity is going to be what is it going to be? Yeah. So brute force approach, the complexity is going to be. order a1 a our goal is to design an algorithm which does much better right now our focus is to compute this exactly we are not allowed to do this in an approximate fashion so later on we will see how to do it approximately we don't really care about getting it exact So once again, just just because I've introduced a lot of notation, let's let's start with some simple example. Okay, so let's say we have we want to compute beta of x one, x two, the let me state the problem. Maybe my goal is to compute beta of x one, which is Summation overall x2, 3, 4, x1, 
X. X. Okay. So this is basically a marginalized product function system. Okay, so now what are the local kernels? What are the local domains? You can take alpha 1 to be f, alpha 2 to be equal to g, s1 is two, s2 is 4, A one is basic two A S two is basically A one A three A four but but now I need a third function. Why is that? Because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm marginalizing with respect to everything except x1, right? So I need something with respect to x1. I need a function of x1. And, and this, is it possible to do it? Just because I'm, I'm sort of notationally said that, is it at all possible to do? Okay, I pick S3 to be equal to, okay, now what about alpha 1? There has to be a local one. So ultimately, I should get the same thing, right? Yeah, right. exactly what we so you take alpha three to be equal to one, irrespective of what the input is, the output is always one. So that that's a very useful trick, right? Whenever you want to sort of more variables or more local domains, so these these are local domains. Uh, you can always introduce these dummy local domains by just multiplying it with one. These local functions are just going to be one. So no matter which local domain you want, you can always introduce it just by multiplying. And, and that will be fairly important. Uh, the reason will become clear only after a while. But basically, we'll want these functions to have certain structure. The only way you will be able to introduce this structure is by introducing these dummy local. Okay. So let's let's now see some more practical examples. Right. What kind of problems can we uh, formulate as this marginalizer product function? So we start with something which some of you may have seen. Start with the Hadamar transform. Uh, so, have you seen the Hadamard transform? Yeah. So, the Hadamard transform is defined for functions for, on some n variables. Suppose you have a function f of 1 up to n Hadamard transform. One by n is defined as f of x n p 
minus 1 raise to 1y1 plus so okay one thing i forgot to mention is that x all the xi's and all the yi's are 0 or 1 These are Boolean, honestly Boolean functions. Okay. It doesn't matter what it's called. Let's say that I want to compute this. Okay. How do I formulate this as an MPF problem? And what are the local functions? What are the local domains? Okay, can you do it a little bit better than that? Again, so our goal is to sort of have make sure that it, it's good if you have a big number of local functions and each local function depends on a very small number of variables. That's always that as we'll see that's advantageous because that brings down the complexity. So I can split the minus one whole power of this as a product of triple term. F of n times minus one raised to one y one two one right. Uh, so in this case, how many local functions do I have? N plus one local functions. So I can take alpha one to be f. What is S1? That 1 to n. Uh, okay, what about alpha 2? Minus 1. X1, 1. Yeah, one comma one uh, alpha p is minus one raised to x two and so on. But I need one more because I, I I'm after all I'm something with y. N, right? So I need n plus two local function. You can always define the, the last local function as the identity. Alpha n plus two is just going to be one s two x s n plus two is just Let's see something that's that you are slightly more familiar with. This, uh, let's say the Fourier transform. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what? Fine. So in this case, again, we are using S and X and Y, which is confusing notation, but S n plus two would just be i hard notation. The same words goes for the Fourier transform as well, right? So again, if you have a Fourier transform of one variable, then basically to compute f of y is integral, or again, if it's a discrete time summation over all x, 
f of x e raised to j 2 pi pi from p j 2 pi f t typically use f for as one variables t as t for time domain and f for frequency domain here i'm just choosing to use x and in general you can define it for n variables f of n again summation over x1 n f of x1 n t raised to k 2 pi summation this is essentially just the inner product between x the x vector and the y vector so the dot product between x the x vector so even this you can write it you can formulate this as a marginalizer sum product in fact, we'll see that computing this, you can compute this using brute force, which is generally how you do it. But in fact, if you do it cleverly and use the same approach that we'll use, that, that we'll develop in the next few classes, you basically arrive at, arrive at the fast Fourier. So, so fine, this is just, okay, these are just problems where you just compute sums. But let's go to the more interesting things where you want to, let's say, compute, do decoding. So that was our ultimate goal. The goal is to decode linear codes, linear or other codes. In particular, if you have a linear code, it, it, it helps greatly. Okay. Suppose you want to compute, you want to do maximum likelihood decoding of a linear code. How do you formulate this problem? What is the maximum likelihood? So, so you, so you transmit x1 up to n. Okay. So this is sent across channel. Get So, what exactly is the maximum like root decoding problem? Okay. 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 Can you give me the objective function? Okay, the max of max with respect to what? Okay, x1 up to xn, arbitrary x1 up to I have a linear code, right? So x1 through xn is coming from a linear code. My goal is to, let's say, decode or, or find the maximum likelihood estimate of the transmitted code word given the received sequence. That arbitrary elements where are the x vectors coming from what which vectors i know but are they just coming are they can they be arbitrary sequences from f to the n Okay, assume that x1 through xn are binary. Okay, we're dealing with binary codes, binary channels. So, are you going to maximize with respect to all binary vectors x1 through xn? Not which subset of vectors are you going to? Okay, fine. You tell me the rest of it first. Probability. Uh, okay, 
to the MLD coding prompt. This is what you are given by one through by one. You are presented with this. Okay, so now maximization with respect to one. All, all arbitrary sequences, all, sequ all binary sequences. Uh, which no I, I just want to know how we are going to do maximum likelihood my goal is to decode whatever the, the code word get the best estimate of the code word basically r max But are you going to maximize this 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 probability with respect to all binary vectors x1 through xn? Is it going to be a subset of the binary vectors? Ah, the code words. They necessarily should belong to the code. Right? Okay. So now how do I formulate this constraint? So, so it's it's a constrained maximization problem. If it's a discrete memoryless channel, then this nicely factorizes into a product of two. Arg max one three uh, times product. But I'm still stuck with this prop, this this constraint. X1 through Xn is in C. Is there a way of getting around this? Can I express, can I still maximize with respect to all possible binary sequences? But maybe introduce some local some extra local function. Yeah, I also maybe need some more local function because again, I'm, I'm I only want to maximize with respect to code words. So it's okay if I modify the object. So right now, what I'm doing is I am I have this function which is defined as this particular objective function. And I am optimizing this with respect to only a subset of binary sequence. What I want to do is maybe modify the objective function. Allow to max, uh, uh, modify the objective function. I want to maximize with respect to all possible binary binary sequences. But I want to make sure that the two maximizations are the same. That is, the, the two have the same optimum. Yes. How? So, right, so I can write this as R max x1 to xn n of product i equal to 1 to n p by xi times an indicator function that n is in the is one way of the same optimization problem but basically i'm maximizing over a larger set but i now modified the objective function so that it takes the value zero for for those which are not code okay can i simplify this even further so this is true for any code right uh, for linear codes we can simplify this 
So, how would you define a linear code? Okay, that is fine. But but again, let's think about it in from this perspective. So, what does this do? So, we have an indicator function x1 through xn is in C. So, basically, you are maximizing all of this. But you are checking whether a particular sequence is in the code and multiplying 1 if it is in the code and 0 otherwise. So how do you check whether a particular sequence is in the code or not, is in the linear code or not? Or even the code. So you know the generator matrix, you know the parity check. Correct. So, h times x transpose should be equal to 0. This is ok. So, I have this and now testing is whether the sequence is a code, or code word or not can be done using h transpose is equal to the 0 vector. Not really. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. So now, can we simplify this further? So again, remember, we want to somehow break this down. Right now, each of these local functions just involves two variables, xi and yi. Uh, this is really the problematic part because it involves n variables. Is it possible to bring down the number of things? In general, it is not possible. But is it possible to break this down into a product of multiple local functions? How many other variables they may involve? Yeah? Yep. Any equations? k is always less than n. We have n minus k equations, right? So, I have n minus k equations and each equation must be satisfied. Even if one of the equations is not satisfied, then it's a zero. So, I can write this as R max product i equal to n of y i times product j equal to 1 n minus k indicator h i where this is the i which is sorry h j where this is the jth row of the parity check matrix times x transpose is equal to Now again, it doesn't seem like we've got any savings. Yeah. Yes. Correct. But 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 again, the, the way I'm measuring sort of complexity is is in the number of variables that each local function involves. Not the time, not yet. So we see why that later. But loosely speaking, what I want is I want a huge number of local functions. Each function, each local function should involve a small number of variables. For me, that is good. Right? And intuitively, to see why that is the case, think again, go back to that f of x1, uh, f of xy times f of yz. So the first function involved only x and y. Second function involved y and z. And that basically brought about some savings. I could use the distributive law in, to, to sort of compute that. Right? If, if the first function involved x, x, y and z, and the second function also involved x, y and z, 
then really I could not use the distributive. The distributive law, you, if, if I want to use the distributive law in an effective manner to reduce the complexity, then I must make sure that each function basically involves a small number of variables. Or basically there's not a lot of intersection in the common uh, local domains. Yeah, exactly. So again, so in this case, I've not really got any savings, any obvious savings. But now if I choose my code in a clever fashion, particularly if I have a parity check matrix where each parity, each par uh, parity check involves only a small number of variables. So basically, if if each row of the parity check matrix is such that most of the elements are zeros, but there are only a small number of non-zero elements in each row of the parity check matrix, then each of these terms will involve a small number of variables. And that is really where you can, where potentially you can exploit this to get some Yes, so the parity check matrix is sparse, then each of these involves a very small number of variables. Okay. If H sparse, transpose equal to zero, this involves a small number of the xi, because you only need to consider those xi's corresponding to a uh, h, uh, corresponding to those entries which are non-zero. You don't really need to care about what the xi's are for the zero corresponding to the zero location. And and that is and that is why you can get savings in complexity when H is sparse. The class of linear codes where H is sparse are basically the class of low density parity check. So a code is said to be a low density parity check code if H is sparse. We'll see again later on we'll see specific classes of LDPC codes where we'll refine the notion of sparsity. We will we'll demand that each row contains a very small number of non-zero elements. Each column also contains a very small number. But at least for, at this point, we can see that if the number of, if each row contains a very small number of non-zero elements, then whatever, as I'm claiming, you can get some savings in complex. Intuitively, it feels like you can do this in a more efficient way. Yes, but again, we will get to that. Not exactly, as, as we'll see later. So, because right now, what I'm doing is I'm trying to find the exact maximum likelihood code, right? Uh, it turns out that you can't do this efficiently, or you only need to approximate maximum likelihood. Okay. Okay. So now, what does now, now again, so so this so we know that the objective function is, is sort of taken care of. We can express this nicely as a product of multiple terms, which is fine. But now we're again stuck with this thing, right? Where we have argmax, right? Which is not easy to handle, right? Because you, you want to compute for all possible x1 through xn. Again, there are two to the n possible combinations. So Finding this for all two to the n possible combinations is really we've not got any savings at all. So instead, what people do is you try to do the following: instead of decoding the entire code word sequence, let's say you decode them symbol wise. Okay. I find the maximum likelihood uh, estimate of C1. I find the maximum likelihood estimate of C2. ML estimate of C3, and so on. I find n ML estimates, 
Okay. Maybe I have some way of computing these ML estimates in an efficient manner. I mean, the end, uh, so I just take the concatenation of all these ML estimates, I call them my decoded code. Now, there's a problem over here because the ML estimate of each of, the, if I take the index, the symbol wise ML estimates, it doesn't necessarily correspond to the block ML estimate. In fact, there's no guarantee that what I'll get is an, is an even a valid code word. But still, people still do this. So, compute the ML estimate of just the ith. So, what is this going to be? This is, or, or maybe let me call it x. M and I because X is the input and Y is the output of the current. So this is R max over just X I. Now X I is either 0 or 1 of the max over all possible X not I. I limit P of Y1 through N given one of n times indicator n is a valid code right so now this basically corresponds to just computing this right? this is an mpf problem done over a max product semi because I can write this as a product of multiple terms and I'm taking the maximum which is basically by marginal with respect to all other terms except the ith variable. This is again not the block ml estimate, this is the symbol wise ml estimate. So I find xi ml for each i. And whatever I get, whatever sequence I get, I, I just call this as the decoded code word. If this is a valid code word, then I can again get back the message. If it is not a valid code word, then decoding has failed. So this is in fact typically how LDPC codes are decoded. Many LDPC codes are decoded. Find the symbol wise ML estimate. So this, this gives you weaker guarantees, but, but it still performs reasonably well. Practical, or, or cell phones basically. Yeah. Wi-Fi chips. Of course that works because there, there are additional layers of error correction. Sometimes people concatenate this with, with some sort of an outer code so because again this the sum with it's the some reasonable guarantee that this is going to be a valid code word, but if it is not, what do you do? So, so that requires an additional layer of error correction and depending on the, the exact communication problem, depending on the standard, either you could test it and if it is not a valid code word, you again you request a retransmission, one way to get around it. Or you use a you, you use a concatenated code, uh, you use an outer code to correct these particular, right? That's maximum likelihood decoding of linear codes. Now, so this is one way of formulating this particular problem, right? I have this max. I can also reformulate this as uh, an optimization problem, but over a different semi instead of the max product semi I can also look at the min sum semi How do I do it? Instead of looking at so what I want is max over x i complement product i equal to 1 n. I given x i times product 
a equal to 1 to n minus k indicator h j x transpose is I have this now this is the same as doing the following I take the min overall x i complement instead of looking at this again I have a product term I have some product terms I want to bring convert it into a sum of multiple terms the easiest way to do it is take the log in fact I'm going to take the negative log of this minus summation i equal to 1 to n minus log p y i given x i plus summation j equal to 1 n minus k minus log indicator h j x transpose is equal Now again, strictly speaking, I should not be doing this because I have log of an indicator function, log of zero. Again, remember the the min sum summary has two extra elements. It has both minus infinity and plus infinity. Because really, you're uh, performing these operations over the set of extended reals. So again, notationally speaking, you can formulate it in this particular form, uh, but but as we'll see later, this this has its own benefits. Mathematically speaking, it, it seems like if you use the min sum semiring, then you will run into a lot of numerical issues because of the because log of the indicator form. But in fact, it turns out that in practice, many a time you use the min sum semiring because it uh, it's more beneficial to do to use this min sum summing than this, uh, and precisely the reason why you go for this is to avoid numerical issues. The reason being that this this seems like a potentially a problematic term, log of indicator. But in fact, uh, in in practice, this turns out to be the problematic. That is because if n is very, very large, these are probabilities, right? And you have product of probabilities. So it will be very, very small, very close to zero. And you are multiplying terms. It's very, very hard to tra keep track of these because they're all floating point numbers. After all, you, you have only a fixed, you, you can't really, you don't have infinite precision. So in those cases, using the, and you're multiplying. Multiplying is much more expensive, is more error prone than addition. So instead, you use the min sum summing, where operations that you perform is just addition, uh, which which has which is less prone to uh, floating point. Which one? Yeah. That again for that you'll see how, how the algorithm works. Yeah. So I'm not introduced any algorithm so far. Right? So right now we're just formulating these problems as marginalize the product function. As we'll as we'll see the the kind of algorithms that we'll have, uh, these these sometimes don't cost so much of any. Again, all of these are related. Okay. So that's one. So that's a, that was another application or one formulation or one problem which could be reformulated as an NPF problem. So let's see another, right? And that is, uh, again, this, this is not in error correcting codes, but basically probabilistic graphical model.
So again, the problem here is, is to do some sort of statistical inference. You have a bunch of data, uh, so a bunch of observables basically, and some variables which you cannot observe, but you know the dependence between the observables and the, the, the variables that you want to infer about. And the question is, you are again the basic problem. You want to do some kind of maximum likelihood estimation, and you want and the the dependence between the observables and the variables that you want to infer about are connected or described using a graphical mode. So you can have a bunch of random variables. Let's call them x1, x2, x3, so maybe okay. or or perhaps take some specific yeah so let's say that these are uh, let's say you have some kind of a sensor network okay uh, maybe where you observe maybe temperatures t1 t2 t3 you have three sensor nodes which are deployed somewhere and uh, they have and they, and they measure temperatures t1 t2 now depending on the location then uh, and maybe your goal is to find out uh, whether there's a fire in in any of these locations or, not, or whether, whether there's a fire with a forest fire or not now another variable f which which is so so t1 t2 t3 are real numbers or maybe there are numbers in a certain range of temperature. F is a random variable which, which is either 0, there is no forest fire, 1 if there is a forest. Okay. Obviously, there is some kind of a dependence. If there is a fire, so there is there, this so the relationship between these could be described using uh, some probability mass or probability distribution um, the density of or the pmf the conditional pmf of f given t1 t2 t3 and likewise you have the distributions of uh, distribution functions for t1 t2 t3 given f equal to 0 and given f not equal to but in general, this could be more complicated. There could be other intermediate random variables, which you may either be able to observe or not be able to observe. Right? So, for example, some of these could depend on the location. It could depend on the weather, so on. So, so maybe T1 and T2 are deployed outside. So, it really depends on how sunny it is. And maybe T3 is kind of sheltered, and there could be some other factor which 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 affects T3. Yeah, maybe humidity. Okay. And then you have this F. It is a basic. So the, the, the fundamental assumption here is that the joint probability of all of these factorizes in a certain form. So in particular, so I have these many variables, P of F, S, H, T1, T2, T3. I can write this as P of T1, P of 2, P of T3 times P of S given T1, T2, P of H given T3, P of F, S. So these are not independent random variables, they are all dependent and the joint probability factorizes in this particular. So the dependences are can be completely specified using this particular. So given any joint PMF, you can always write a corresponding network of this particular. 
So you write in terms of the conditional probabilities. Once you write it in terms of these conditional probabilities, you first bring out all of those terms which are which, which involve only one term and, and then look at the conditional dependence of each of these and basically you draw an edge between from t1, t2 to s if s depends on t1 and t2 in this particular factor you, if, and, and so on. So this is in general called a Bayesian network or a probabilistic graphical network. So once again, our goal is to find, is, is to marginalize some, some sort of a product. So the goal is to find maybe arg max for f in 0 or 1 p of f or maybe p of f given p1, p2. So, this basically involves finding P of F equal to 0 given T1, T2, T3 and P of F equal to 1 given T1, T2. Uh, but how do I write P of F given T1, T2, T3? This is equal to P of S given T1, e2 p of h given p p of f given s h marginalized over so the problem of finding p of f given t1 t2 t3 can be expressed as marginalization of some joint distribution In all of these, the important point is that I can, there is sort of weak dependence between variables. So, in this particular Bayesian network, they are not highly interconnected. In this case, S depends only on T1, T2, H depends only on T3, and F depends only on S and H. So, in particular, conditioned on S and H, F is independent of T1, T2, and T3. Once again, we have an MPF problem. So, if we have a generic algorithm which can solve any MPF problem, then uh, then basically we, we can solve a whole range of problems, going from decoding linear block codes to solving Bayesian networks to computing the Fourier transform or the Hadamard transform. So we'll see one last example uh, and then we'll close, which is again very, very close to what we've seen so far, uh, and that is decoding convolutional code. Or this is also essentially the same as estimating hidden Markov model. Right? So so in, in convolutional codes, what did we have? So symbol transmitted at time t could be written as some t0 times mt plus t1 times mt minus 1 and so on. So this is if, if the convolutional code is represented by a generator sequence corresponding to an FIR filter. T k minus one, T minus right. And what is the goal? The goal is to find out uh, or get the maximum likelihood estimate of this entire sequence m1, m2 up to m t minus maybe. Arg max over m t of empty given received sequence y1 y2 all the way up to infinity. 
or up to a certain length. So again, we have a whole bunch. So our goal is really M1, M2 up to Mk. Our observables are Y1 up to Yn. But now we also have these other variables, Xt, which really link the interdependence between the Mts and the Yx. So, so these are in some sense hidden states. If you've seen hidden Markov models before, these are Xt's correspond to hidden states. Uh, Mt's are, are those which you want to infer. And Yi's are your observables. Right. So, so once again, you can always, in, in exactly the same form that we had over here, you can write the joint distribution. So, you have P of Y, X, M, P of Y given X times right and the goal again is to marginalize it with respect to everything except i complement or again m i complement again we are typically conditioning this with respect to one particular y so for a given sequence y your marginalizing it with respect to all x and all other mj's not including so this this basically gives you a way to compute or, or this is a formulation of, of finding this the ML estimate of MT given Y1 through Y. Again, this can be formulated as marginalizer product. So in the next set of lectures, we'll see how to solve a general MPF problem over any uh, commutative semi-ring exactly and then we'll see that this is not enough right? not, not everything can be can be run efficiently it really depends on the problem at hand depends on the function that you have and at least for error correcting codes uh, good code for if you, if you want a good code which achieves a small probability of error it turns out that if you try to solve it using this particular approach uh, the complexity blows up, it's still exponential, you can't do anything. So instead we'll resort to doing approximate methods to computing this. Again, the idea is to still marginalize a product function, but we'll try to not do it exactly, but rather approximate. And that will be based on the same approach, but using slightly different techniques. Let's stop here. Any questions?